Hey there, Mana Online. Welcome, we're so glad that you're with us. Man, aren't you glad that the presence of God isn't confined to any particular place or location? I can experience the presence of God and so can you right now. So come on, let's press in, let's lean into this and posture our hearts as Mana Worship leads us in a few songs. All right, come on, if you're not standing, let's get up on our feet. Let's declare the name of Jesus Christ, amen? salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I believe in the crucifixion, by His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. Come on, let's sing this out. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit.
Come on, right now in this moment, let's declare the name of Jesus. Let's sing this together. I just want to speak. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Yes, Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Thanks for worshiping with us. You know, on a regular basis, we like to lift up our military personnel in prayer. So would you pray and agree with me? Lord, we come to you now. We thank you for every man and woman that serves in our U.S. Armed Forces. God, thank you for them. We don't take them for granted. Thank you that they 
often will lay their lives out on the line to defend our freedoms, even the freedom to worship you freely in this country. So God, we are grateful for them. Lord, we intercede for them. We ask that you'd go before them and behind them, that you would surround them with your presence. Lord, especially those who are downrange, Lord, would you keep them safe as they run towards the battle? Give them wisdom and discernment and surround them with your protection. Lord, bring them home safely. Also, be home, uh, be, be with the families that are at home. God, thank you for them. Thank you for their sacrifice. Lord, we ask that you would comfort them, that you would be their provider, that you would meet their needs. And as they're reunited with their family, God, we ask that you would build strong marriages, strong families with you at the center. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thanks for praying with us. I wanna say again, welcome. We're so glad to have you here at MANA Online. Listen, if this is your first time tuning in, we'd love to hear from you. Even if you need to pause the video, do us a favor, would you text the word guest to the number that's on the screen? Again, we'd love to hear from you, see how we could serve you best, if we can resource you any way possible. Also, if you came prepared to give, we have a couple of easy ways you can do that. You can always give online at our website, mana.church, or you can download the Mana Church app on your smartphone. Or you can even text the word MANA to the number that's on the screen. Again, you can pause the video if you need to. If you'd prefer to send us something in the snail mail, you can look up our address, look for the Cliffdale site location on our website. Well, listen, we've got a powerful message for you today. We're starting a brand new series called Spirituality. So get ready, but first, check out these video announcements. Small groups have definitely impacted my life. Um, I've met a lot of people, made a lot of connections. Coming to a church um, the size of Mana, just a lot of people, the campus is pretty big. Um, it helped to make it more personal. I made some connections, passing people in the halls on Thursday nights, putting a name with those faces, um, just really being able to find my place here and just have those personal connections has been very impactful. So over the years and um, just being in small groups, my faith has grown tremendously. Um, back in 2020, my mom was home on hospice. Um, she ended up being home for 13 months. Um, it was the most challenging time in our lives. It definitely tested our faith. We were actually in a prayer small group at the time and just having the support of those ladies and just having them stand in the gap for us, um, it really encouraged us having text messages in the morning, prayers, offers for a meal. Um, we're still in contact with a lot of those today who just reach out to us and check on us and make sure, you know, especially on the anniversary and things like that, just to um, check on us, make sure we're doing okay. And those connections will last for a lifetime. I've met so many people through small groups, uh, so many life-giving relationships that um, even people that I met when I first started serving on teams that I've moved on from and serving on different teams now, um, I think of my friend Renee Irvin and her two girls. Uh, I met them, they were probably one of the first connections that I made on the Thursday uh, serve team, because serve team is also a small group. Um, we connected, our girls were younger, probably middle school at the time. Um, we have to make intentional time to get together now because we both moved on to other small groups, but we've made that connection way back when, probably six years ago, and still really, really good friends with them. So it's been, it's been a great blessing to our lives, the connections that we've made. This is important because our generation is broken and hurting. We know the problems that they're facing. We understand that it's, it's hard when you, when you see all these issues, mental health, anxiety, depression, that's, that's running rampant right now. And when we feel like we have the solution, when we know the answer. Man, are we doing our job if we're not telling people that? 
What's up, Man of Church? I want to say a great big welcome to each and every one of you, wherever you're joining me right now, whether that's right here in this room or wherever you are on the other end of that camera. Perhaps you are at one of our amazing multi-sites right here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region. Maybe you're at a microsite all across the military highway, one of our city sites, MANA Online, YouTube, wherever you're joining us right now. Can we put our hands together and make them feel welcome? We're kicking off a brand new series today. The series is entitled Spirituality. And when I say that, spirituality, uh, you, you, a, a bunch of things jump to mind. Well, what could, what, how, how would you define spirituality? I bet, I bet we were in the prayer room before we came down here and one of the pastors was saying, if we just went to the mall and said, define spirituality, boy, that would, come, that would be a whole lot of something. You know what I mean? Be a whole lot of things. Well, um, I want, I want, just as we kick off today, I want you to think, what, what, imagine for just one second, who, who is the most spiritual person that you know? You just think about it, don't blurt it out loud, think about it for a second, and, and may, maybe this is somebody that you, maybe this is a historical person, maybe this is somebody that you know, maybe this is somebody that you follow on social media, who is the most historic, uh, who is the most spiritual person that you know? And, and once, you've, once, you've, once you've got that person, set that person in your mind, and then I want you to think, maybe it's more than one person, I want you to think, what is it about this person that makes them the most spiritual person that I know? You, you, is, it, is it something that they do? Is it a practice of theirs? Maybe it's, maybe it's the amount of wisdom that they seem to walk in and possess, or perhaps it's, perhaps it's, I don't, I don't know. What, what is it that makes them the most spiritual person that you know? Maybe it's the way that they pray. Speaking of prayer, um, there was a teenager who stopped by the florist on his way home from school. And so he walked in and he got three individual bunches of flowers. And he went up to check out and the florist was like, what, I, why do you have three bunches of flowers? And he said, well, I have got a hot date tonight. And so, uh, you know, I, if, if, you know, if it works, she's gonna get a bunch of flowers, but if she lets me hold her hand, I'm gonna give her two bunches of flowers. And if she lets me kiss her, it's gonna be three bunches of flowers. So the florist was like, oh, yeah, cool, you got this all figured out. So he, the kid checks out, goes, goes on his way. He goes over to his date's house, and it's a little bit early for the movie, and so she meets him at the door and says, why don't you come on in and have dinner with the fam? And so he walks inside, and uh, he, he, the family all comes in, and then all of a sudden he raises his hand and says, can I pray? And he then leads out with the most amazing prayer you can possibly imagine. I mean, it, it's just incredible. And you know, he goes on and on and on, and finally he stops and lands the plane, and in Jesus' name, Amen. And his date leans over and says, I did not know you were this spiritual. And he leans back over and says, and I didn't know your dad was a florist. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. I would not have responded. Listen, 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 listen. I got a 15, almost 16 year old daughter. I'm just telling you, I would not, I would not have responded the way that florist did in this fake joke that I just made up. I'm gonna tell you right now, it would have been time for all sorts of discussions with that young man. I'm gonna tell you right now. Woo. Local pastor murders teenage boy. Anyway, no, it's not. <laughs> Stop. Stop. I'm gonna be a dreamboat. I'm gonna be a dreamboat. Not going to be a dreamboat. It's going to be tough. But anyway, but let's let's go back. Let's go back to that question. Let's go back to that question. What well, what is it that makes what is it that makes a person spiritual? But before I before I told you that joke, thanks, John. Um, I asked you to imagine that person, and we all had a reason for thinking why that person or persons is particularly spiritual, and. Mostly we think of spirituality in terms of our connection or understanding of the supernatural. And sadly, we, we are, uh, um, surely rather, not sadly, we, we are supernatural beings in a natural and supernatural word, world as believers. We're, we're always aware of the natural realm, but we're also aware that there is a supernatural or spiritual realm as well. So it only makes sense that we see as most spiritual that which appears to relate to how we operate supernaturally. But, but what if I told you 
that spirituality is incredibly practical. Now, when I define spirituality, I'm going to define spirituality as being, especially for, or I'm going to find spirituality as being based in knowing and being known by God. That's going to be the foundation of spirituality, the person of the Holy Spirit helping me draw nearer and closer and becoming more like Jesus. But I believe the Bible teaches that there are several pillars upon which we can build lasting, meaningful, spiritual lives. And I, I, if we think that the people that we thought of just a second ago, I think that these people, if we looked at the practices that are in their lives, I think that we would find, I think that we would find them building on, lives on these foundations, or at least lives similar to these foundations. So today, I have for you four practical pillars of spirituality, and they are holiness, consecration, the second is solitude. Might I just say quickly about solitude? I know that when I say solitude, some people go, well, we're gonna skip that week. He's gonna talk about going and living in a monastery. He's not talking about that. Solitude is not the absence of sound, it's your absence of words. Anyway, more on that next week. Mm, easy, easy. I, some people got excited already. The third is love. What, what is more spiritual than love? The fourth is baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time talking about, in the fourth week, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a bonus, fifth week. We're going to do a fifth week on service. So why I call it the four pillars of spirituality? Because I just wanted to say there was a bonus, fifth week. On Easter, last week, I talked about resurrection power. I talked about the idea that everything about this relationship that we have with Jesus is all based on the idea that Jesus is alive in bodily form and triumphed over sin and death for you. That, that's, the, that's the entirety of the gospel. You ready for the gospel? Jesus got back up. That's it. And so when we talk about spirituality, I'm aware that we're talking about sourcing out of the power of Jesus' resurrection. I think, I think though, I don't think, I know, that it is, it is incumbent upon us who follow Jesus to live every day as if it's resurrection day because Jesus is alive, and it's to us to walk more closely in relationship with him. And so I'm going to talk about, that when I say we're talking about Jesus and resurrection, we're talking about power, obviously. So I'm going to talk about power, and that's what we're going to talk about in the fourth week of the series when we talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, because we're all looking for the power that walked Jesus out of the grave, and that's who the Holy Spirit is. But before we get there, I want to talk about some foundational practices, some foundational disciplines, some foundational rules for life that we establish for ourselves and hold ourselves to that set the foundation to be truly spiritual people. Now, don't be afraid and tense up. I just said disciplines and I said rules and I said all sorts of things. I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking about asceticism or stoicism or dead, empty religious works or any sort of works-based salvation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about practical practices, disciplines that demonstrate the power of God lived out in my life. People whose lives are a demonstration of naturally spiritual, being natural and demonstrating a natural spirituality with supernatural power. So, I wanna talk about these pillars and I'm gonna to start today with pillar one, holiness or consecration. Holiness is defined not as better than. Holiness is not measured like I'm climbing a ladder and the higher I get up on the ladder, I'm better than the people who are below me on the ladder. Mm -mm. It's not what holiness is. Holiness is being set apart, which is where I get this idea of consecration. It's an idea that's as old as the earliest writings of the Hebrew scriptures. Consecration is the action of taking someone or something and setting it aside for God. And we take that action over ourselves, over our lives. When we, when we take that action, we choose to embrace holiness. Now, here's the thing. Holiness is not so that I can make myself better than you. 
Holiness gets a bad rap because holiness is sort of lumped in with the whole holier than thou and judgmental type idea of how people live their lives. And here's the thing, holiness is not so that I can make myself better than you. Holiness is to make myself better than me yesterday. Holiness is about walking freer from the sin that so easily entangles. Paul, Paul, talks, Paul talks about um, running a race. And when Paul talks about it, he says, I, I beat my body, which means that I've got some rules, some disciplines. Anyway, I, I beat my body so that I can prepare myself to run this race so that I might win the prize. Now, here's the thing. If I win the prize and you can win the prize and you can win the prize and you can win the prize, it means, hmm, I'm not racing against you and you and you and you. I'm racing against me. It is incumbent. I've now used that word twice, which means my wife is going to tell me if I use it a third time. I can't use it anymore. It is incumbent upon me to walk more with Jesus, which means more free from my past tomorrow than I did today. You with me? All right. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to start talking about holiness, and I'm going to talk about it from Psalm chapter 24. Now, this is interesting because this is a Psalm of David. Speaking of guys that you don't want your daughter to bring home. This is David, my murdering adulterer boyfriend. And he gave me three bundles of flowers. You know, that's, okay, never mind. You didn't remember the joke, forget it. <laughs> it means they were smooching on the way over. I don't, I know, just keep going. David is gonna talk about, holy, how is it that David is gonna be listed in the New Testament as a, wait for it, man after God's own heart? Jesus is gonna come sit on the throne of David. David's gonna have gotten a hold of something that's gonna be really, really powerful and important. Psalm chapter 24, and I'm gonna begin in verse three. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? This is, this is the core, this is the core of spirituality. I told you a second ago, spirituality is walking with God. There's a, there's a spiritual father of mine, Jim LaFoon, who, who, who talks about spirituality this way. He says, spirituality is having the veil between my life, between me, the natural realm, and the realization of the closeness of God, the veil, get thinner. Meaning what? I'm becoming more aware that he is near. Spirituality is the original design of humankind. It's how we were designed to live in the beginning. It's how we were designed in the garden. We were designed to walk with God in the cool of the day. So how do we walk? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Verse four tells us who can do this. Verse four, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Clean hands, a pure heart, does not swear deceitfully. What is it, what is it that we're talking about? We're talking about walking free from sin. We're talking about walking free from things that entangle us. We're talking about being free from entanglements. We're talking about walking in increasing levels and measures of freedom from entanglement. Who does not lift their soul, swear to what is false. Verse five, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God, his salvation. If we put sin down, what is David saying? We can live a supernaturally spiritual life that is completely natural. Listen, this entire series is about the challenge, the challenge to walk more closely with God. Because here's the thing, we talk a lot about purpose here at Mana Church. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. You have a purpose. You, God has a plan for your life. You have a destiny and a calling. You were made and placed in history to change the world. This all sounds like vision that we talk about all the time. And here's, here's the thing. In order to walk fully into that purpose, here's, here's the most important thing. You're gonna have to walk with God. Have to. 
have to. It's your original design. It's, it's the place that you are the most fulfilled. And so, can I, can I just, can I say this? I want you to have this relationship with him, which is why we're talking about this series of spirituality, because I want you to have the secret of how to walk with God more closely. That's, that's our desire, right? Is that not our desire to be these people in Psalm 24 who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stay long in his presence? I believe it has to be your desire. Why on earth would you have gotten up this morning and come into a church service unless that was your desire? I mean, they serve brunch in this town. You know what I'm saying? You could have gotten a stack of pancakes. Instead, we're talking about this. The person who walks with God is the one who embraces holiness, consecration, set apart, distancing myself from my default setting. What's my default setting? Me first. People who embrace holiness are living out a cycle. And this cycle is how we walk out the process of sanctification. Now I'm gonna quickly explain, I'm gonna quickly explain sanctification because when, when you surrender to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you, some people call it conversion. I don't much care for that word because the Bible doesn't talk about conversion. The Bible talks about becoming a disciple. What does that mean? That means a trade, all of my life for all of his. I walk out of my old life into a new life. When you become a disciple of Jesus, in the moment that you invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you are justified. Jesus' perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection means that your standing with God is set. He's got you. Jesus did the work to save you. He's going to do the work to keep you. You've heard that one before. Then we begin this process of sanctification because I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not perfect yet. That seems like a shock to some of you. Um, (laughs) If that is a shock to you, take your phone out, put it on selfie mode. There's a sinner. Oh, there's one too. Found him. What begins after salvation is what's called sanctification. This is the process by where the Holy Spirit shapes us to become more like Jesus. This is why we talk about a day-to-day walk with God because what we begin in this process of sanctification is the Holy Spirit removing myself from me and replacing that with more of Jesus. Suddenly, the disciples of Jesus start to look like Jesus, start to sound like Jesus, start to act like Jesus. So what is this cycle? This cycle is three C's. There's conviction, Confession and change. Let's start with conviction. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because, uh, I lost my place, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Conviction is what Paul's talking about when he uses the word godly grief. What what is conviction? Conviction is when you know that you're wrong when you know that you have sinned. It's the moment, and this is gonna feel like it's an experience that's familiar to me. I'll let you figure out whether it's familiar to me or not. It's the moment when you're standing in the kitchen and your wife says something to you and you roast her back and then all of a sudden, as it's coming from your mouth, you're going, no, and reaching out to grab them and your stomach goes from here to there. (laughs) Back of the room is really quiet. The holy people are sitting back there. It's all of us sinners up here. I get it, I get it. Conviction's that moment when you know that you've sinned. It's not a wonder, it's not, oh, I wonder if I stepped over the line. No, 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 you, you, know, you know what you did. Here's the thing. It's, it's, like, it's, like when, it's like when you work out in a gym, it's like when you are, are an athlete, they'll tell you, you know, that pain, pain, is, pain is actually your friend. Pain's not a bad thing. Pain, pain means that you've done something. 
It's the same with conviction. Conviction is not a bad thing. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction is a helpful thing because here's what conviction does. Conviction, if you deal with it in this cycle, if you deal with it in the right way, conviction produces repentance. And here's what repentance does. Repentance takes me back to the cross. You go, wait a minute, I thought we were past Easter. No, no, no. The cross is not something I needed on Easter day. I celebrated one time a year. The cross is something I need every single day. Why? Because I'm a sinner. And what I need to do is when I recognize that I have missed the way, that I have sinned, repentance takes me back to the cross and then produces in me the, 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 the life that allows me to walk where I can live without regret. Ima- imagine that. That, that. That's the beauty of what Jesus has done. We can live without regret from our past. Now, The other side of this coin is worldly grief. Worldly grief doesn't help because worldly grief has condemnation and feeling sorry for myself and lobbing a whole bunch of curses in my general direction. Worldly grief looks like when I've gotten caught, I I, I have had little kids. I don't really have as many little kids anymore. That's even weird to kind of say that, but my, my, even my baby is not much of a baby anymore. But you know, when they were little, and you caught them doing something, and they knew it, and you told them you can't do that, and they were like, yeah, okay, but like their, their face was nodding, but they hadn't changed, they hadn't broken, you know what I mean? The, the will was still very much in action. That's worldly grief, because it makes excuses. Worldly grief pushes you away. You know, the Bible actually says that we should approach the throne of grace with confidence. Can I call a quick timeout? Why would you need to go to the throne of grace unless you've done something in need of grace? Hello. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why do we have this idea that when I've done sin, when I've done wrong, when I've done bad, I need to step out of the presence of God to somehow clean myself like I was going to do that on my own anyway so that I can then approach his throne again? No, 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 no. Worldly grief pushes you away. Condemnation pushes you away. Conviction brings you close. Conviction is specific. Condemnation is a cloud. Conviction is specific. Condemnation is a cloud. The Holy Spirit is clear. John chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus is telling his disciples, guys, I've got to go away. He actually says in John 16, it is to your advantage. What? Jesus, you're going to leave? It's to my advantage that you go away? Oh, yes. Yes, because I will send another parakletos is the Greek word. I'll send another advocate. I'll send another helper. He says in John chapter 16, verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Conviction is one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. If I just go ahead and give away the whole series right now, which I'm going to, the Holy Spirit is deep spirituality. Like that's, I know, shock of the day. Don't, don't skip the rest. It's going gonna, it's gonna to build nicely into the fourth week. Don't even worry about it. He is deep spirituality because he, here's what the Holy Spirit is to you. The Holy Spirit is the one who is leading you in the process of sanctification. He's the one who is preparing you for eternity with your Father in heaven. And he is the gentle voice guiding us when we need it the most. And here's the thing. His conviction is always an embrace because the Holy Spirit is clear. I can remember, I can remember moments in my life, and look, if if there's anybody who's walked the path of conviction, confession, change, which those are the other two I'm gonna get to in a minute. I'm not teaching this this message from someone, I I didn't just like study this. This is not a concept that's ethereal and far off. I have, I have, whoa, I have walked this path. In case you haven't figured it out, I am still a sinner, fairly adept at it, fairly good, <laughs> fairly good at messing stuff up. The Holy Spirit's conviction is clear. The Holy Spirit's conviction is an embrace. I can remember, this was about 10 years ago, I, I got in a car accident and um, I had a grade three traumatic brain injury. I almost died, it was, it was fairly rough. And I remember 
all the things that happened in my body as a result of that, and all of the cloud, and all of the everything that was happening in my mind, and I remember saying to my wife one time, I was in my living room one house ago, I said to her, I wish this was a sin, I could just confess it away. The Holy Spirit is clear. The Holy Spirit's conviction is like an embrace because he, rec- he helps you recognize the wrong that you've done and he puts his arm around you and he, he's, he, he, is, he is the one who is about to help you in the process of repenting and then walking more fully into freedom. When I talk about the Holy Spirit, I am also aware that there is, some, there is some potential denominational baggage that comes along with a conversation on the Holy Spirit. Can I just tell you a little bit about myself? I am the oldest son of a former Catholic who went to a Southern Baptist school, and then I married uh, an ex-Assemblies of God girl. So if you can possibly get more confused, hello, here I am. I'm a hot mess. The, The thing about the Holy Spirit and the clarity of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, poor Holy Spirit gets accused of being the great disruptor. And the thing is, I, I read in scripture that he might disrupt your plans, but he's clear and he's specific. He's not chaos. So here's the thing about, here's the thing about conviction. Get as sensitive as you can to conviction. Pursue the ability to feel his conviction and become aware, and I recognize what I'm saying to you when I say become aware. Can, can I speak to you real plainly? I'm not old enough to be, most, to be all of your dad, really. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm maybe close enough to be to Funkle or Fun Cousin, you know? Get good at discerning the voice of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you one of the things that's going to fight you and challenge you. It's that phone you're carrying around in your pocket. It is designed to disrupt you and to interrupt you. Get good at pursuing his conviction. Be sensitive to those little twinges. Hmm. I should not have said that. Hmm. I should not be thinking about this. Hmm. I should not have thought that or looked at that or fill in the blank. Learn to look for it, learn to treasure it, and if I could be so bold, actually, literally pray for it. The second C in this cycle is confession. Confession means to say the same thing as God. So, we call sin what he calls sin. Now, can I tell you what usually happens right here? What usually happens right here is some people say, okay, now you need to list all the sins so that the sinners will know that they're sinners. Friend, number one, I know I'm a sinner. Number two, we can't expect those outside the covenant to behave like they're inside the covenant. Other people say, though, well, then this means that I can define sin for myself. You can't do that either. The Bible defines what Jesus says is sin and what he says is okay. He was, he is, and he always will be really clear in the Bible. So listen to me. I go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It's like my only action step in all the messages. The Bible, you gotta read it, you gotta know it, and you gotta obey it. There's a reason we talk about the Bible being the handbook for life, because here's the thing. The Bible said it, I don't need to stand up here and read a litany of it, I need to tell you, read this and live it. If you're struggling with that and go, man, I just, I really need, you know, I need you to be clear. Okay, perfect. I'll tell you who to be clear with. Be clear with yourself. You ready? Call your sin, sin. Actually, use that word. Call it sin. Don't call sin a mistake. Don't blame others. Don't make excuses. Call sin, sin. So, where do we confess? It's a great question. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know how, we're, you know how we are prone? It's actually in Genesis You know what happens when we sin? What's our very first inclination? Hide. Absolutely. God is always standing by to cleanse us, consecrate us, to make us holy again. He always forgives. You confess your sin to God to be forgiven. 
Do I just need forgiveness from sin? No, you also need freedom. You need healing. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And that's probably not what's on the screen. The prayer of a righteous person has a great power as it is working. I confess my sin to God to be forgiven, but I confess my sin to others to receive healing. Hiddenness gives sin its power, and you are as sick as your secrets. This is a this is a Michael this is a Michael Fletcher ism. This is a this is a saying of my dad. There needs to be, at least there needs to be one other person on the planet who knows everything about you. You need every single person wherever you're watching me right now. There needs to be at least someone else on this earth who knows everything. I I say that same that same kind of thing. I say it a little bit differently. I say give the keys to you a way to others. What does that mean? Empower other people with your triggers and your buttons. This is is what I mean, this is what we mean when we talk about confession in community, when we talk about accountability, when we talk about being around other people who are gonna help you walk more freely from the sin that so easily entangles. When I tell you I walk freer in my life, I'll never say that I'm free, but I'm running faster than I ever have before. When I tell you that I'm walking faster away from sin than I have in the past, it's because of confession in community. It's because, yes, I have asked God for forgiveness, but I've also confessed sin to others so that they can hold me accountable so that they hold the triggers and go, "Mm, no, you said you weren't gonna go that direction. Uh, You said you weren't gonna watch that. Uh, You said you weren't gonna go to that that place and have that drink. Uh, You said you weren't, you with me? Also, on that, that's called accountability. Accountability is not a whole bunch of people uh, who all fail in the same way meeting together to talk about their failure. Accountability is when you find somebody who is a little bit ahead of you, somebody who's out of the fire and can look you in your eyes with fire in their eyes and say, stop this. There is hope. You can walk free from this. Now, a lot of people think that conviction and confession is where it stops. If I'm convicted and I confess that to God and I confess that to somebody else, and that's it. I don't need to do any more. There's a third C. The third C is change. Confession, oh, I'm sorry, conviction, confession, change, which means what? You've got to repent, which means you've got to head in a new direction. Confession without change is just apologizing. Again, this is a Michael Fletcherism. My dad used to say, confession without change is sin management. I wonder who he told that to. (laughs) You go, how do I know I've repented? I'll help you. Confession with change equals repentance. Listen, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about holiness, the distance in between the last time. I'm talking about walking free and establishing a snowball type pattern of I'm running away from that. We're never gonna be perfect. That's not the point. The point is to get back up, dust yourself off, experience conviction, confess, ask God for forgiveness, and then change. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy, will obtain mercy. Yeah, it should say something that I'm quoting some of these verses. What does that mean? This is, we're gonna get to this in a second when I read you Psalm 119, but it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. My dad raised me to believe that if I needed to walk free from something, I needed to sandbag that thing with scriptures in my life. So I'm just quoting back to you some of the disciplines that I placed in my life so that I could step back away from the line. But, Proverbs 28, 13, whoever confesses his sin, uh, whoever, whoever conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces finds mercy. That's where I get the statement, hiddenness gives sin its power. Conviction begins the process, the process of, of bringing our sin into the light. Confession 
continues this process. This is me calling what God calls sin, sin. But then, then I actually have to change. I have to turn away. I have to put it down and walk away. That's what repentance is. Repentance is to turn around and to head in the opposite direction. Why? Because mercy is waiting. Listen to me. This is, this is the thing, this is the thing about the, none of these disciplines, n- none of the disciplines that we're gonna talk about, the, the, the disciplines, the pillars of spirituality, none of them are going to make you more spiritual. They are gonna put you in the proximity of true spirituality, who is the Holy Spirit. It almost sounds like semantics when I say, listen, discipline begets discipline. And so what I'm doing is I'm placing hedges of protection in my life to put some distance between me and the problems, between me and the sin, between me and the things that are my natural inclination to fall down into that or to fall down into this. I place a barrier around my life and I don't walk better than everybody else. I walk closer to him. I want to finish with Psalm 119. I'm not going to read you the whole psalm. Somebody said amen. It's very long. (laughs) Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By praying more. By, I don't know, any action. By guarding it according to to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'm telling you, you want to sandbag yourself from the sin that so easily entangles. We're talking about confession, which means to say that what God says is a sin is a sin, which means I have to have this in my life or I'm not going to know. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. If your heart is passionate, natural, supernatural, spirituality, if that's your heart, and I believe that is your heart, develop an appetite for the Word of God. The more you walk the cycle of experiencing His conviction, confessing, and walking out change, repentance, what you will discover is your appetite for the Word of God And all of a sudden, the way that your life works in proximity to the presence of God suddenly takes on an entirely different dimension. You're going to see the world differently. You're going to see the future differently. You're going to see the political climate in which you live differently. You're going to see everything differently because suddenly you're the elevated, the elevated, what's the word I'm looking for? Your your perspective. Suddenly your perspective shifts entirely because suddenly my eyes are not fixated on all the things around me as if I get all these things right, everything's going to be fine. No, your eyes are fixated on the one who made things right already and calls you into relationship with himself. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we're grateful for that work. Grateful for that work on the cross. As we're, as we're closing in prayer right now, both in this room and everywhere, I, I, I know there are people for whom this is going to hit fairly close to home. And let me tell you, let me tell you something. There is hope. Jesus loves you and he has a plan for your life. And as long as you breathe, there is no too far that's too far. I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that. What we're doing with these disciplines is we're making some predecisions. If you have a predisposition to pornography or to lust or anything like that, predecisions look like I'm not going to watch that type of show. I'm not going to watch that movie. 
People are going to think I'm a weirdo. Yeah, well, they, yeah. But your convictions will still be intact. Talking about making decisions ahead of time before you find yourself in the situation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and minister your healing and your, your life to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, you keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. Maybe, maybe for you, where Jesus needs to, where you need a touch right now. Because you've never surrendered to Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I told you, relationship with Jesus, Jesus got back up, is the foundation of spirituality. There's not a discipline you're going to be able to put into your life that's going to make you right with God. You can't try hard enough. You can't be good enough. You can't walk free from sin enough. It cannot be done. Only one could. His name is Jesus, and he invites you into relationship with him. If you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, or if you're not walking in relationship with him, then with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you for an action step. It's going to be really simple. In a second, we're all going to pray a prayer out loud together. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you, but if that's you, just raise your hand and hold it up long enough for me or one of our team members to see it. Hey, if that's you and you want to make that decision right now to invite Jesus into your heart, to place your faith in him for salvation, then I want to pray with you. So wherever you're at right now, if you want to make that decision, just repeat these words after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for your love and for your sacrifice. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and my sins. I repent of my sins. I ask you to save me. Be my Lord and give me faith to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Congratulations. Listen, if you just made that decision, if you just prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate with you. Welcome to the family. In fact, do us a favor. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, text the word Jesus to the number that's on the screen. We'd love to hear from you, see how we can resource you. We can even send you a Bible if you need one. Just let us know. Text the number. Also, if you're here and you would like prayer in any area of your life, we have a team standing by that would love to pray with you. So if that's you, text the word prayer to the number on the screen. All right, Man of Church, we love you so much. You're the best church in the world. God bless, and we'll see you next time.